supper starting at 4 to 7.30. So don't forget to come back for that. And uh, the last one, but not least, that's for sure, is that Bible study that uh, Pastor and Jim Lund from Obetz um, want to start on Saturday mornings. So if you're interested in that, just let the pastor know, um, or Jim Lund, either one. Thank you. Also, remember this week that our uh, Roman Catholic brothers and sisters are uh, choosing new popes. We want to remember them in our prayers and ask God for wisdom as the cardinals gather together to make that uh, rather historic uh, kind of uh, uh, choice as our the former pope has stepped down. I think the last one was 600 years ago who retired. So that's quite something. Yeah. So please remember all of our brothers and sisters in your, in your prayers as they go through this week. Please stand now as we hear uh, our wish for three words and questions together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Have mercy on us. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For longing to have what is not ours and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others. Holy God, holy mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For jealousies that divide families and nations, and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. Holy God, holy mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God, and for carelessness, with the fruits of creation. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For hurtful words that condemn, and for angry deeds that harm. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ, and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. By water and the Holy Spirit, God gives us a new birth and brought the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God forgives us all our sins. Almighty God, strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Amen. We sing our opening hymn together. <laughs>
peace, let us pray to the Lord.
from Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsibly Psalm 32. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven, and whose sin is put away. Happy are they whom the Lord is so guilty, and his spirit While I held my tongue, my bones withered away, because of my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in the time of trouble. And may the waters of the flood, they shall not destroy you. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Second reading is from the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. son. 
treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still a far way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slave, Quickly, bring out a rope, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost in this mound. And they began to celebrate. Now, the older son, the elder son was in the fields. And when he, uh, he, when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. baptism and we were chosen by God. Then we learned that we were forgiven, but we have been forgiven by God. We are loved by God. And last week that we need to, during Lent is a time to reflect upon doing some new things. So Marvin and I got into this big discussion this week and he wanted to talk about one thing and I wanted to talk about another. And Abby, if you'll open the box, let's see who won. What's in there? Oh, a can of corn, Marvin won. Okay, a can of corn. Well, if you were paying attention this morning, and I know Marvin must have been because I practiced the song this week only to sing a different part this morning. Thank you, Rashad. And we were talking about it was it's a time for all things. And in that song, there was also a part about giving. Now, if you look out there, can anybody take a guess about how many folks are sitting out? I'll tell you, it's between 65 and 75. Pick 68, that sounds like a good number. Okay, now all these people are hungry and they're going to come to your house after church. What are you going to feed them? Corn, well, okay, corn. I, I don't think one can of corn is going to go quite that far, but uh, okay, you're all going to the cauldrons afterwards and they're serving the corn. If you don't want corn, don't go. Well, we have a couple of folks in our congregation that work with our food pantry. And it's Mr. and Mrs. Myers. Do you know them? Well, if you look back there, they're waving their hands. Okay? That's, yeah, but you know them. Yeah, I knew you know them. Well, Mrs. Myers told me that last week they served about 65 people in the food pantry. Now, if you remember back at Christmas time, do any of you remember what was sitting in the back, back there? There was a Christmas tree and it had things on it. Do you remember what those were? 
hats and mittens. Well, we can't do a hat and mitten tree in, in the spring because we don't need hats and mittens. But we also collected food, and we collected a lot of food at Christmas time, and we bought things for adoptive families, and we really take good care of people who need things. But during Lent, sometimes that falls off. And so Marvin brought a can of corn so he can put it in the basket back there, and I also know he brought some peanut butter that's back there to go to the food pantry as well. But you realize that if each person here had brought one can of food, be it fruit or vegetable or, or whatever you like, tuna, chicken, I don't care, uh, we'd be able to have more than corn at the cauldrons after church. So Marvin's challenge to you is during Lent, we need to give to others the way God has given to us so I challenge each of you next Sunday and the following Sunday and Easter Sunday to bring at least one can of something to go to the food pantry because we have a lot of hungry folks out there just like we did at Christmas time, okay? So if you could do that, I would appreciate it. And did any of you do well putting your shoes away this week? Okay, how about dirty clothes in the clothes hamper? All right, Abby, at least we got one. All right, cauldrons, 1245, corn, and uh, we'll see you later. And don't forget your can next week. All of you need to bring at least one can of it, whatever you like, or whatever you don't like. Okay, thank you.
And the younger said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estates. So he divided his property between them. Doesn't sound like much, does it? Unless you know the uh, culture in which Jesus grew up in the Middle East. It seems benign, but it already signals a deep rift between this young man and his father. By initiating the request, the son is saying something like this. I wish you were dead. And you're not. But I can't wait for my inheritance. So would you please give it to me now? To say such a thing in Jesus' day was so against the community norms that it would have been expected by others who heard about this in the community that they would have expected that father to got up and severely beat his son on the spot. That's the kind of a front this would have been. And if he wouldn't do it, it's possible that the people of the town might have taken that young man out and stoned him to death. But the father doesn't break into a range. Rather, he divides the estate between his two sons. According to custom, the eldest would have gotten two-thirds. The last third would have been divided between the rest of the male siblings. Well, there's only two of them. But the father doesn't go two-thirds and a third. It seems that he divided it right down the middle, gave half to the eldest and half to the youngest. And not only did he give it away, but he gave him the right of disposition, which never would have happened in those days. Which means... You might have divided it if there was some circumstance that would have warranted that, but here would be the deal. The father would retain all the income from the property until he died, so he had something to live on. So they would have possession of the property, but the income from that property would be used still to maintain the family. The father here not only divides the property, but gives his sons, both of them, the right of disposition, the right to sell it immediately without regard for him or the rest of the family or the rest of the estate. It's also telling that the oldest son, whose job it would have been, if there's a rift in the family, to step in with his dad and his younger brother and to try, try to play the reconciler role, to try to reconcile this relationship before it got any worse than it already was. He didn't do that. Nor did he reject his half of the settlement, if you will, of the estate. And say, no, 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 Dad, you keep that. I don't need it now. You hang on to it. No, he accepted it. This also says that there's something going on between the elder son and his dad as well. He's in his own far country, as we'll see later. While normally it would take months to sell property in the Middle East during Jesus' day, this younger son sells quickly, within a few days, and he's on his way. One reason he has to sell it quickly is because if word gets out, no one in the community, A, is going to buy the property off of him, because they're going to go to Dad and say, do you really want to sell this? How did the son come in possession of this? We want to know the facts and the details. He didn't want that to happen, so he disposes of it really, really quick, before word can escape out that what he has done. And he manages to sell it. And within a few days, he takes all of that he gathered from that, and he moves away. He now acts at a distance. He's acting out that separation that he already had with his dad in the relationship while they were together. Out on his own, he spends a very short time, everything that took his father a lifetime to approve. He went through it like a dose of salts. He spent not just money, but the very substance of his father. This is so great thought to me because probably within another 10 years or so, my mom and dad's generation is going to bequeath to my generation something over $6 trillion of, of wealth. That's going to be the biggest transfer of wealth, really, maybe in all time. And I wonder how will my generation do at being a good steward with what my mom and dad's generation bequeaths to us. It is a sobering thought. In Jesus' parable, after the younger son's wealth is gone, a famine occurred upon the land. And this young man's friends evaporate overnight as quickly as his money had. 
He has lost his father's inheritance, the Gentiles, which would be increasingly bitter. One thing to lose it to a fellow Jewish person, but to lose it to Gentiles? Unfathomable. And he is in need. So the young man attaches himself, really the text says, glues himself to a citizen of that country. Now the hospitality code of the day dictated that a host just couldn't throw somebody out. I remember as a young man, we went to uh, King's Plantation, somewhere in the south, I forget where exactly, I was a little kid, but one of the things that really stuck in my mind is they would tell how when people were traveling, you always look for a farmhouse or, or an estate that had at least two chimneys, because that meant those people were people of wealth. If you could have not just one chimney to eat out, you got two fireplaces in the house, man, you got some money. So you want to go and, and ask if you could lodge with them. Well, the owner of this plantation, King's Plantation, in his memoirs, his notes, he talked about a young man who had come to stay with him. wasn't a relative. He just was on the road, and he stopped and asked for hospitality, and they extended it to him. And he said, in his memoirs, he said, in his, um, oh, what's not your memoirs? What am I talking about here? What do you keep? A diary. In his diary. He said, I didn't mind that the young man came, but after two years, <laughs> You think he'd go? Can you imagine? He still hadn't thrown him out after being there for two years. I found that hilarious and incredible. That anybody, first of all, would have the courage to uh, save for two years, and that this guy hadn't thrown him out yet. Well, that's the kind of hospitality we're talking about in Jesus' day. So, what would you do? You're a Gentile farmer, and this little Jewish kid, young man, you know, is asked for hospitality, you just can't refuse him outright. That's not the way it works. So what do you do? Well, you think, hmm, how can I? You give the guy the worst job on the place, you know he won't accept. So he says, look, I'd love to help you. But the only job on the, on the place is I need somebody to tend the pigs. And I know you're Jewish, and you never want to do that. You would not want to mile around a pig. I know, I don't want to offend you. But that's all I got. The kid says, I'll take it. Oh. That's what happened. And so what they fed these pigs were carob, carob pods. They were bitter. They weren't really good tasting, but they were edible. The pigs could eat them, and human beings could eat them if they were prepared right. The kid would have loved to have some of those carob pods, but nobody gave him permission to have any of them. So the pigs are eating. They're doing fine, and he's tending. And he's got a place to stay, but he's starving to death. So things are not much better for him than they were before. He wished he were a pig, and not just a pig farmer at that point. His whole life plunged even deeper than it already was. The rift with his father bears its own fruit at this point. He has lost his family, he's lost his community, he's lost his father's inheritance, and he no longer can fulfill his fiduciary responsibility to take care of his father as his dad ages. Further, he's lost his friends, and he's lost his self-respect. He's lost, in fact, his very self. As if things could get worse, he's starving to death, and as he contemplates his fate, uh, his fate among the pigs, he comes somehow to his senses. And he comes up with a plan by which he might redeem himself and get out of this pickle that he's in. He decides he's going to go to his father and throw himself upon his dad's mercy, seeking to become one of his hired hands. Better be a live servant than a dead son. In this way, he can earn his keep. Avoid eating at his brother's table. Repent for losing his father's inheritance and maybe in time be able to save enough to take care of his dad in his old age and thereby he will redeem himself. At that point, when he can do that, he can ask his dad for forgiveness. And his dad might say, yes, you screwed up. Yes, you lost the money. Even the Gentiles, all my hard work is gone. But look, you were a dad, but now you've really become something. You worked hard, you regained the money. Now you can take care of me. I forgive you. That's what he's looking for. 
Meanwhile, back at home, dad is keeping a silent vigil. Because dad knew from the moment the kid left, he's coming back. Anybody ever had that thought about their child? I just asked. <laughs> you know, because of circumstances, when they left, they're not going to last. Is it going to work out so well? He's coming back. And so he kept the silent vigil looking for his son every single day. And while the boy was yet a long way off, his father spotted him, and he was filled with compassion. Now they wore robes like I do. And in order to, uh, in order to run in an outfit like this, you've got to reach through your legs, grab the back part of your hand, and pull up through your legs. Okay? That looks attractive. <laughs> and then you can run without tripping. So here's a, a nobleman, okay? And you gotta understand, noblemen in those days did not hurry anywhere. In fact, there was a, a pastor in the Middle East, his congregation fired him, let him go. You know why? Because they said he hurries around too much. He doesn't have proper dignity for his stature and place in the community. And they got rid of him. So this, this would have caused all kind of consternation within the household to see the nobleman, the master, hike up his pants, you know, basically grab it, and he takes off down the road. You can just see the scene, can't you? You can see the servants going, the old man's off his way, and they're running after him, down, you know, running after him, trying to keep up with him as he runs to get to his kid. Now, he wants to get to his kid before the rest of the community does, because if they see him coming, they know why he left now, they know what happened, and he's going to have to run the gauntlet of verbal and physical abuse to get back home, and they might kill him. So dad wanted to get there first. And so here he runs down the main, you know, down the main street of town, out to the other side. And what the son wants to do, he's supposed to prostrate himself on the ground and kiss his dad's feet. And as he gets up, he'll kiss his hand and he'll give this spiel. And hopefully the father will have mercy on him and take him in as one of his servants and he can put his plan in place. But when his dad gets there, he doesn't let him hit the ground. He grabs him in a bear hug and hugs him and kisses him. And while he's hugging his son, he's barking out orders to all the servants that run in behind, gasping for air. And he says, go get a, go get a robe of the best one. Get shoes and put them on his feet. Get a ring and put it on his finger. Well, what's that about? Servants went barefoot. Only fam family members were sandals. And the ring is a signet ring. It means you can do business in the family's name. He's reinvesting this young man as a son, as a member of the family. He'll have none of this business of the servant. And the kid's trying to gasp out, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. And that's as far as he gets. Because he's faced now with another dilemma. He slapped his dad metaphorically in the face, or worse, when he left. And now he's got to make a decision. If he accepts what his dad's just done for him, given him sonship again, given him familyship, made him a part of the family again, he can't redeem himself. He can't. He couldn't get out. Treat me like one of your servants. He couldn't do it. He could have, but he chose not to. That would be to humiliate his dad yet again. And so he allows the father to do for him what the dad wants to do. And it means at that moment, he can never, ever repay the debt. Forever he'll sit under the table owned by his brother. And he'll do work on the farm or the ranch forever as a member of the family that gets no pay, but does it just because that's what you do. And he'll never be able to redeem himself and go to his father and say, I screwed up, but now I've regained the money, now I can take care of you. And his dad can see I forgive you because now his dad already said, I forgive you, but I love you. And I make you a part of the family again. And in that moment, true forgiveness happened. And true repentance happened. It happened when he was forgiven. 
not back there when he dreamt up this, this scheme of redeeming himself. Repentance happened when he was in his dad's arm and he simply couldn't offend him again and he gave up. And basically said, without words, Father, your will be done. Your will be done. It was the costly demonstration of unexpected love. It was costly because the Father humiliated himself. It was costly because the whole community will think he's nuts. The servants certainly do. It was a demonstration because he ran. He found him. He grabbed him. It's not the son just came home. The father was looking for him. The father found this boy. And the father redeems this child at a cost to himself. And next he moves to have redemption happen with the community. Go get the padded calf and kill it. Well, you don't kill a calf unless you've got a lot of people coming to dinner. You hear what I'm saying? He might open a can of corn <laughs> to have a few people over. But if you're killing a calf, you better have a lot of people. He's, he's going to invite the whole community to come over. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to butcher, have that, cow, that, that calf butchered in the doorway of where the party's going to be. And that blood's going to fall on that doorway. And that's a sign and a symbol to the community when they accept the invitation to come to the party and they step across the blood to enter into that place of celebration. They are saying, we will not kill your son. We will accept him back into our community for your sake, Dad. For your sake, we will accept him. And then the older brother comes in from the field. He's been at work all day, tired. He hears the celebrations, calls one of the servants, so he says, hey, what's going on? Your brother has come home. And your father has killed the bad calf and called the whole community. Come and celebrate and dance because he was lost and he's found. He was dead and he's alive. And the son stays outside in palace. That's really what he did. He had a good power. He wouldn't come in. Now and again, the, young, the older brother should be the one who is hosting the party. That's his job as the elder son, to host the party. He won't even come in. And his father has to leave all the community folk that scattered and stepped across the blood and walk out and plead with his elder son. That would have been a humiliating thing to do. To leave the party, to go out and try to fetch your oldest son in was humiliating. It was shameful to have to do it. But he did it. As he ran for his other son, he steps across the blood and walks outside and pleads with his elder son to come in. And what does the older son say? This son of yours wasted all your living on prostitutes. There was no mention of prostitutes, and that's how he wasted it. Dissolute living. He gave parties. He was lavish with the money. He gave it away. He probably drank a lot. Pretty soon it was gone. You know how that goes? Yes, I'll make a $500 bottle of champagne. Yes, thousand dollars here. Well, it's gone. And so are all your friends, right? That's how it works, right? Drinks for everybody. Never worried about prostitution. But the older son, that's how he would have spent it. And he thought if that's how he'd spent it, the younger did the same thing. But there's no word about that. He's already made a judgment about this young man that probably isn't true. But the father doesn't go there at all. He says, but we had to celebrate. Because this brother of yours was lost and was found. He was dead, and yet he was alive. And the parable ends, not knowing, does the older brother stay outside and pout, or does he come to the celebration? And through all those three parables, Jesus is speaking to his detractors, the Pharisees and the scribes, the theologians of the day. And he's asking them, you're the older brother. You should have done the job that I'm doing. It was your job to go get the lost sheep the house of Israel. It was your job to go collect them up and bring them back to the fold. You didn't do it, but I am doing it. And what you're doing to me is pestering me and bad-mouthing me and, and uh, you know, niggling me all this time, making like I'm doing something bad. You should have done it. You didn't do it, so I'm here to do your job. Are you going to stay outside and pout, or are you going to come in and celebrate? And that's where he leaves it. And we don't know. All we know is pretty soon... They were looking for ways to kill him. Because in all those parables, Jesus
Jesus becomes the woman who finds the lost coin, the shepherd who finds the lost sheep, and the father, who is unlike any other Middle Eastern noble, who redeems a lost son by costly demonstration of unexpected love, just like the cross. And the only thing left is to ask us, are we willing to die to ourselves and fall, fall in the arms of our Father in heaven and give up? Quit trying to redeem ourselves. Quit trying to find our own way home. But simply accept what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And accept that costly demonstration on the cross of unexpected love that redeems us and makes us whole. To sit at His table where the Father throws the celebration, the wedding feast, in honor of His Son, Jesus. And you and I, you're all invited as invited guests in honor of the Father's love. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he sits in the right hand of God. He will come again to judge us.
that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth in the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
body of Christ.
Please stand with me. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen.